Hello viewers, thank you for joining us once again for our regular Wednesday evening Skeptics in the Hub. Now tonight we've got ex, well retired, <laughs> orthopaedic surgeon, member of the British Medical Association, and he moonlights as a magician. So he's a member of the Magic Circle as well. Richard Rawlins. Richard, welcome. How the devil are you? Lovely to see you all. Great. We caught you in the middle of swigging your drink. Sparkling <laughs> actual mineral water. I've got one too. This is alcohol-free beer, but it's a thirsty business, so we, we do need refreshment, don't we? Now, you're going to talk to us about complementary and alternative medicine. That'll be great. And you're something of an expert in this because you've been doing presentations to your peers on the medical council for some time, I believe. Oh, I, I give lectures to medical audiences, lay audiences, anybody who will have me. <laughs> okay. Well, shall we screen your production then? Go ahead. Ready when I'm, you're... I'm, I'm going to leave you to it. I'm going to take myself down, put up your presentation and stay in the background so you'll be the only person on screen off we go well good evening everybody here we are we're going to talk about the real secrets of alternative medicine you will see that i am an mbbs which in the uk means equivalent to the american md i'm a doctor Ooh. i also did a master's in business administration to learn how to run the national health service and you can judge for yourselves how, how good I was at that. More. Ooh. I am a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. I specialize in orthopedic and trauma surgery, and I still write reports as an expert witness for the courts. Woo, encore. But most importantly for a lecture like this, I am a member of the Magic Circle. Next slide, please, John. Now, here I am at the Penn and Teller Theater in Las Vegas. The point is that I have been trained in the arts of deceit and deception. So you might think I'd be the ideal person to talk about alternative medicine, which does much the same thing. Next slide, please, John. I promised John I was going to wave my drumstick for a change of slide. Let's see how we get on. We're going to have a brief introduction. One of the problems I've had as a practicing surgeon, as a doctor, is to try to understand how come at the end of the 21st or 20th century and into the 21st, how did we get to be where we are now? How is it that so many people are still involved in alternative medicine? And then I'm going to reveal some of the secrets, perhaps not all, and perhaps not ones you agree with. Let's have a go. Next one. At all times, it is essential we consider Mrs. Smith. Now, this Mrs. Smith is, of course, an actress playing the part of a a disgruntled patient. But Mrs. Smith comes to see me and she sees me in my surgery and she says, look here, I've got this terrible arthritis in the hip. What are you going to do about it? And I say, well, I can give you a nice new hip. And Mrs. Smith says, well, that's all very well, doctor. But what about alternative medicine? Does that work? Might that help? Would I be taken advantage of or would I just be fooling myself? And I say, well, I really don't know much about it. And Mrs. Smith said, well, perhaps you ought to find out, Doctor, and write a book. So I did. And now for a small fee on Amazon, you can purchase my book with the same title, Real Secrets of Alternative Medicine, which I call an expose. We're going to be talking about supplementary, complementary and alternative medicine. For some reason, the S in SCAM is usually dropped. I, I don't know why. Simon Singh and Professor Ernst wrote a great book about trick or treatment a few years ago, and they said that these scams or CAMs were any therapy not accepted by the majority of mainstream doctors, biologically implausible, untested, unproven, disproven, unsafe, only marginal beneficial, or which are simply placebos. That's what we're going to be talking about. Does it matter? Well, I say it does matter. It certainly is a very large slug of any country's e economy. The expenditure on, on alternative medicine is held to be up to 1.2 billion pounds per annum in the United Kingdom, 34 billion in the United States. And the global market 
is estimated to become something like two, over $200 billion by 2026. The National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine in the US, which has now changed its name to National Center for Integrated Health, uh, that is a body set up to answer important scientific questions about natural products, mind and body practices, and pain, ma pain management. And that has spent $2.5 billion on research over 10 years and has proved quite conclusively that, that there is no benefits beyond placebo. Its current budget is still $142 million per annum. Yes, I say it does matter because that money, time and trouble could be better spent on improving conventional care. I think there is a moral hazard because we're setting a mindset for patients and politicians and the public. There is an intellectual impact. Some people call it, uh, noticed a flight from science, a lack of critical thinking. A couple of years ago, the word of the year was chosen to be post-truth. And now we're dealing with false news, false hope, false claims, and certainly false doctors. So yes, it does matter because ethical treatment should not be based on lies. And these false claims are most prevalent in cancer quackery. And uh, the homeopaths in the United Kingdom, the Advertising Standards Authority issued an enforcement notice because they were claiming, many of them, that they had a cease therapy which could cure, yes, that was the word they used, cure autism. And the ASA said, look, you can't make these false claims. In many countries of the world, we are all bumping up against the anti-vaccination movement, particularly with COVID, but it started a few years ago before COVID. In fact, probably anti-vaccination has been around ever since Jenna started playing around with using uh, cowpox to deal with smallpox. Just down the road from where I live in South Devon in the United Kingdom, we have Brixham, the biggest fishing port left in the United Kingdom. There, 94% of susceptible children are vaccinated. And these figures come from our local MP. Just down the road, 10 miles away in Totnes, only 74% of susceptible children are vaccinated, way below the amount needed to achieve herd immunity. So what's special about Totnes? Well, here's a sign put up outside the historic borough of Totnes, twinned with VIRE, V-I-R-E, in France. But uh, somebody's crossed that out, and there we see that Totnes is now twinned with Narnia. That was a good gag, and bless his heart, the borough council allowed that to stand for a couple of years. Then they had it taken down, whereupon somebody else put up a different sign saying that Totnes was twinned with Area 51 in Nevada, where, of course, the aliens landed. Now, look, this is an important matter. There's Mrs. Smith. She's keeping an eye on there. Do you see her up in the top left corner of the slide? But the Daily Mail, one of Britain's most read papers, has said it's an important matter. Charles in NHS homeopathy row, referring to Prince Charles. He's been held. He's been holding secret meetings with the health secretary and lobbying for treatment denounced by top doctors as witchcraft. Yes, it does matter. The House of Lords report in 2000 did a report on the different autonomous systems of medicine based on novel theories of health and well-being. At that time, the whole topic was wrapped up in the acronym CAM. Uh, I have to say I preferred to, to refer to it as chemistry. And I say that chemistry is a practice of healthcare, not of medicine, but of healthcare uh, carried out by chemists on camis, the people who go along to see them. But maybe that's just a bit too jokey for your taste, your choice. The House of Lords identified different groups of these alternative medicines to try to make some sense of the vast panoply of opportunities that there are. There are some that the House of Lords described as being professionally organized. It doesn't say they approved of them, but they were just well organized. And they're the five you see up there. I'll mention those in a fraction more detail later. There were group two therapies which seemed to the House of Lords to be better established. And again, you can read those for yourself. Group three were alternative disciplines, often from the Orient. No worse for that, except there simply was no evidence of any benefit other than the fact that patients enjoyed going along and having a bit of 
uh, attention from practitioners of these various disciplines. It also included some European disciplines such as anthroposophical medicine, which was founded by Rudolf Steiner. Uh, Reiki was Japanese. Uh, radionics was American. And, and all of these lumped together were based on concepts of energy or vital force or spirits, which is all very well, if only there was any evidence of these entities. There is no basis in proper modern scientific understanding. Here are a few more disciplines. Prince Charles himself set up a foundation for integrated health, uh, now closed down, and he tried to promote those disciplines you read at the top. And then underneath that, I'll spend the next 25 minutes reading out. No, I'm not going to do that. I just list them there to show you that there are so many other different alternative medicines which are lumped together under the broad rubric. Moving on, I had to think to myself, well, where did all this come from? A thousand years ago, we humans knew in Europe at any rate, what was causing diseases. We knew that diseases were caused by the gods. And we also knew that the gods would put the diseases right. The Greeks had some 600 gods doing various jobs around the universe. But uh, the chap who looked after health was Asclepius. And then when the Romans came along and took over the Greek empire, the Romans changed his name to Esculapius, a name which, uh, by which he is still well known today. 400 years before Christ, we had the Greek Hippocrates, who had a school of medicine. And he rejected these gods as spirits as the cause of disease. And he referred back to an ancient idea, ancient to him, uh, from the Babylonian times, there were four elements in the world. There were only four elements that made up the universe in which we live, air, water, fire, and earth, each related to humors. I won't read them out to save time. You can see them. And these humors had to be balanced, and they were balanced by bloodletting or bleeding, by causing phlegm to be coughed up, or yellow, by, yellow bile to be sicked up, or black bile, well, it would go the other direction. And Claudius Galenus, in the Christian times, introduced four uh, temperaments allied to these four humors. And this idea of humorism simply continued as mainstream medicine for two millennia, until we're just about getting over it at the time of a period in history we refer to as the Enlightenment, kicked off by Francis Bacon, perhaps, who wrote a new organum, a new work about how to uh, discover what was going on around us. And William Harvey took up his ideas and applied Bacon's principles. Bacon was a patient and also a stimulus to Harvey. And Harvey wrote his book about the circulation in 1628. Let's move rapidly forward to Gordon Guyatt and David Sackett, who introduced the term, but not the idea, that the term evidence-based medicine. And all that meant and all that still means is that we modern doctors should get the best evidence that we can. We should recognize that it is not very good in many cases, but it's as good as we can get. And we should apply it conscientiously. Mark Crispit prefers to call it science based medicine, but really the same principles apply. So now let me consider the secrets. What is it? that the alternative medical practitioners, alternative health practitioners, don't want you to know. Well, the first thing to bear in mind is that chemistry, as I prefer to call it, does work. Oh yes, complementary and alternative medicine works, but not a chemist wish you to believe. Now, that rather depends on what is meant by work. And there are two effects to consider. All doctors, whether alternative or regular, can have type one effects on the patient's psychological and physiological response to a constructive therapeutic relationship. We can call that bedside manner. Patients feel better if they feel cared for. But what, what we are concerned about, particularly as regular conventional doctors, is are there any effects of our treatments on the pathology and the course of specific illness? And in the case of chemistry, no, there ain't. The scientific evidence for chemistry or CAM having any effect on disease is pretty much zero. Professor R. Barker Bussell wrote about this, and he was a, a director of the National Institutes of Health, looking at complementary medicine. And in 2007, his book, Snake Oil Science, 
suggested that CAM therapies are nothing more than cleverly packaged placebos. And that's almost all there is to say about the science of CAM. But the point is, placebos do work. They work in the sense that patients report they have been comforted, consoled. In that sense, they have benefited. But the disease, the illness, the disability itself is unaffected. Here's a little test. It's the only question this evening, just to wake you up. What do you call alternative medicine that works to affect a disease? Yes, I can hear the answer even where I am in Devon. The answer, of course, is medicine. That's what you call alternative medicine if it works. And how do we know it works? We carry out clinical trials. Let me mention James Lind. He was a ship surgeon with the Royal Navy, as indeed I have been myself. And the Navy had a lot of problem, all navies of the world, with sailors suffering from what we now call scurvy and which we now know is vitamin C deficiency. Well, Lynn didn't know what caused scurvy, but he did do research and show that citrus fruits cured scurvy. He carried out clinical trials and used control groups. He also reviewed the systematic work of other doctors and scientists working on the matter. And Lind is credited with having introduced the principle of controlled clinical trials, CCT. And because he uh, showed that citrus fruits were so helpful, the British Royal Navy used lemons and oranges to help its men, its sailors, except that in the West Indies, they couldn't find many oranges and lemons. And so they had to resort to limes instead. And plenty of vitamin C in limes. And it also, of course, gave the name uh, taken by the Americans to call the British sailors limeys, a name which is still used pleasantly, I hope, today. The next chap we should consider is Louis the Sixteenth. Well, he had a checkered career. But he did introduce a commission to investigate the work of Dr. Anton Mesmer, who said he could mesmerize patients, that patients had animal magnetism. And using clinical trials, they show quite convincingly that there is no such thing as animal magnetism. That didn't stop Elisha Perkins in the United States coming up with the first medical patent in the United States of America. First patent for a medical device, 1796. Here we are, six centimeter long metallic pieces of, of uh, metal looking like a Bradall, uh, different alloys in a nice leather case. And these were used as tractors. These were used not to prick the patient, but to draw the humors out of the patient. And Elisha came to Britain here in Bath, his, his son, Benjamin, and here's Benjamin drawing out the gout from this poor fellow. Until Dr. John Haygarth retired to Bath and carried out some trials using placebos. He took these very expensive $5,000, $6,000 today, those Bradalls, those tractors, and he took those and he used them on some patients, and he used his own tractors on other patients, his own being made of wood painted to look like metal. And a funny thing was, there is no difference between the two groups. So John Haygarth was able to present in 1800 his paper to the Bath Literary and Philosophical Society, of which I'm still a member, on the imagination as a cause and cure of disorders of the body exemplified by fictitious tractors and epidemical convulsions. Well, Haygarth proved that uh, the imagination was playing its part. And so the third secret to consider is that medicine uses scientific medicine and chemistry does not. We know what science is. We establish a premise, carry out an experiment, make observations, we analyze the observations and the secret to science, we repeat that work just one bunch of results will not do. Science is what we've learned about how to keep from fooling ourselves, said Richard Feynman. And since Feynman was involved in the development of the atomic bomb, he probably knows a bit about science. The other end of the spectrum, of course, is faith. Just, oh, I believe, it, it seems to me, waggle of big ears. 
Well, faith is important. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But there is a hierarchy of evidence and certainly faith is there. But we need to move up the hierarchy through case controlled studies, randomized controlled trials, meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials until we get together all the experts that we can nowadays by Zoom and we carry out systematic expert reviews. So that's how we tend to conduct modern medicine when we can. And sometimes we resort to more traditional methods. This chap is saying, heads, you get a quadruple bypass, tails, you take a baby aspirin. Well, that would probably work as one way of doing it, but not everybody would agree it's the best way. People who behave like that, you might think of as quacks, practitioners who promote unsubstantiated treatment. Ben Johnson in Volpone, he knew what a quack was, a turdy facey, nasty pasty, lousy farticle rogue. Here's a quack, Paracelsus. Look at his name, Paracelsus. I, he said, am alongside Celsus in my ability and skills. His real name, you see there, was Bombastus von Hernheim. Well, he said it. He was a botanist, physician, alchemist, astrologer, and regarded by most of his colleagues as a charlatan. But I mention him because our friend Prince Charles has uh, recommended him to the British Medical Association. Thanks for that, Charles. Why is anybody involved in quackery? Well, it's lucrative, the profit motive. The income from sales in the United Kingdom, a homeopathic company, Nelson's, more than 35 million pounds a year. Boiron, another homeopathic company based in France, but also a large presence in America, 614 euros million per year. The traditional Chinese medicine market, not necessarily homeopathy, but it's different for a variety of ground up bits and pieces. The TCM market in China is said by 2025 to exceed 96 billion euros. So we have the profit motive. We also have, and here is a quack who's going to be closely involved in this profit motive, but here's another profit motive. Many quacks simply revel in the adulation and discipleship their pretense of superiority events. So that's the prophet motive. And I think that's a good gag. I commend it to you and congratulate William Jarvis for coming up with it. It is a matter indeed of branding and marketing. Now, when I was younger and inventing sex, drugs and rock and roll in the 60s, we tended to think about this style of med medical practice as being fringe, fringe medicine. And then it soon became alternative medicine. And then alternative didn't sit quite comfortably with the alternative lifestyle, uh, with all the drugs and the hippies and the uh, other naughtiness. And so the name switched and became complementary. And that's pretty much where it is now, uh, except that it has in more recent years become integrated, uh, integrated in the United Kingdom or integrative subtlety of spelling in the United States. And now we have to talk about integrated medicine. Many of these alternative friends uh, would like to see their practices in, incorporated or integrated into regular conventional practice. That's their aim and objective. Josephine Briggs, who's been director of the National Center, National Center for CAM, says integrative medicine represents an invasive rebranding. That's all. It's a matter of branding. Rebranding of snake oil by practitioners who raise unrealistic hopes and promote approaches that are not sensible, supported by evidence, or proven safe. Integrative medicine is harmful. Mark Crisplet said, if you integrate fantasy with reality, you do not instantiate reality. If you mix cow pie with apple pie, it does not make the cow pie taste better. It makes the apple pie worse. Why do, why do we have to bother with this subject at all? Well, the fact is, Clinician, clinicians care. Uh, they're not employed as scientists. They do not seek the truth. We seek to offer patients consolation, hope and love, rather like faith, hope and charity. And the fact that doctors accept that patients do indeed use CAM does not imply endorsement of CAM. The days of medical paternalism have passed. Patients should be given fully informed 
consent. And that means patients should be told that these alternative treatments have no evidence of any benefit beyond placebo. Ethical treatments simply should not be based on lies. So let's look at some of these treatments. Homeopathy. Dr. Samuel Hahnemann was a good doctor. He wrote his book, The Organ and of Healing Art, using the same name as Francis Bacon, talking about the organ, which in fact was an old uh, classical title from Aristotle. And um, he rejected the conventions of his day. He rejected all the bleeding, purging, emetics, expectorants, toxic drugs. But that wasn't good. And I mean, a lot of his patients got better. There's no doubt he was a good doctor. His patients got better because they weren't being bled and purged. But he then drifted off. And he said that diseases are caused by morbid derangements of the vital force. And one of his biographers said, well, you know, he's lost track. He advanced beyond this simple concept to spiritism. And he lost his way in occultism. And that is the fundamental problem with homeopathy. There are two laws that Hahnemann espoused. They're not laws in any modern scientific sense, but that's the title he gave them. Firstly, he took an ancient idea that like cures like. A small dose of something that causes a particular symptom in a large dose will in fact cure that symptom. He also introduced the law of infinitesimals. He took a unit of mother tincture, added it to 99. He had one in a hundred. One in cent one centum in Latin, or one C if you're just going to put it in an advertising brochure. This one C potency was succussed, banged together, and that was repeated 30 times to a standard potency, potency of 30 C, taking one unit plus 99 of a solvent, usually water, sometimes alcohol. Well, one in 30 to the ten, power of 10 to the power of 2 is 1 in 10 to the power of 60. And there you are, 1 in 10 to the power of 60. That's the sort of dilutions we're talking about. When you got to get to 1 to the power of 10, 20, 10 to the 23, you almost certainly have no original molecule left. And by the time you get to 10 to the power of 60, there really is no single molecule at all of the original substance. But the homeopaths believe we're now back to faith. They believe that there's enough magic energy in whatever is left to be able to drip it onto little sugar pills. And those sugar pills then will have an effect on the patient. Here we are. Here are the sugar pills. And you can see there the symbol of 30C, diluted to 30C times. Some homeopaths use 200C. Well, of course, it doesn't matter because there's nothing in 30C and there's nothing times nothing times nothing, whatever, in 200C. So nothing times nothing is still nothing. So it really doesn't matter how many it is once you get beyond, I don't know, 10 to the 6, perhaps. There might still be the odd molecule left but down at 10, uh, 10 to the power of 1 in 10 to the power of 60. Nothing at all. I went to Wainsworth's, a shop round the corner from the Royal Society of Medicine in central London, a homeopathic pharmacy. I went to them on the internet to make it easy and I asked for some 30C concoction and I chose on the internet my own mixture. This was entirely off my own bat. And Ainsworth's, bless their heart, within two weeks had provided me with an appropriate file of sugar pills. I chose three elements. A homeopathic tap water, a homeopathic tap water, don't laugh. Rohypnol, which of course is the date rate drug, but don't worry, <laughs> since there's no molecule there, it isn't actually going to worry anybody, even if they took a gallon of it. And some Tyrannosaurus rex, which I understand is the scrapings from a thigh bone of a fossil found in Germany. But again, uh, don't be too alarmed about that because the amount taken is infinitesimally small. Well, why did I choose Ainsworth's? I chose Ainsworth's because they are promoted by two very eminent people in the United Kingdom. And we know uh, these people working for them and helping their marketing efforts. And there we are. We can see the badges there, the badge of Her Majesty the Queen and her son, the Prince of Wales. And these two uh, British personages promote these homeopathic 
travel pills. I wrote to Prince Charles and asked him what evidence he had there was any benefit from the pills he was promoting. And almost by return, his secretary kindly responded, but did simply say that the prince doesn't enter into correspondence on this matter. A terrible shame because here we have the prince. He's got some evidence, presumably, uh, that these pills offer benefit, but he won't share it with the rest of us, his future subjects. That's not very scientific, and yet he is a fellow of the Royal Society. I really don't know what's going on with science in the United Kingdom. After Harneman, well, John Weir was another doctor from Glasgow, and he also lectured the RSM, the Royal Society of Medicine on Homeopathy, and uh, he was then knighted by George V. Well, I've lectured the RSM, and I'm still waiting for my knighthood. George VI, the Queen's father, had a horse. Hypericum, which won the 1,000 Guineas horse race in 1946. Why is that important? Because Hypericum is, of course, St. John's wort, which is said to have wonderful effects on depression, which I think uh, that horse winning the race said more about its owner than it did about the horse. Edward Back invented flower remedies, and Peter Fisher uh, was the director of the Royal London Homeopathic Hospital in, uh, until he was unfortunately knocked from his bicycle and killed only a couple of years ago. By then, Peter Fisher had changed the name. He had rebranded the Royal London Homeopathic Hospital in order to market it and promote it. And it is now called the Royal London Hospital for Integrated Medicine. Oh, yes, they're jumping on that banner. However, in the NHS, the National Health Service, Homeopathy, homeopathy is not supposed to be prescribed. Yes, there are still some doctors who do prescribe homeopathy, uh, but they shouldn't do so. They've been told not to. And in time, they're going to have to stop that practice. In America, a chap who called himself doctor on the grounds that his father had been a doctor and he'd always wanted to be one, but hadn't quite made it for one reason or another. A.T. Still was a magnetic healer. He learned, learned his trade from a chap called Paul Castor, and he learned to uh, manipulate bones. And he felt the patients were so much better after manipulation. And he developed his own style of manipulation, which he called osteopathy. And uh, he moved from being a magnetic healer into being a manipulator. And he said that the fundamental principles of osteopathy are different from any other system. And disease was the result of anatomical abnormalities, which had to be adjusted. And another chap, oh, I have to say that uh, some other osteopaths who followed still uh, invented another variety of alternative medicine called craniosacral therapy. And they said they could attune subtle rhythms in the cerebrospinal fluid by moving the bones of the skull. And you will see adverts and you'll see osteopaths advertising that they can cure croup and other baby illnesses by moving the bones of the skull. Well, good luck to any parent who allows its child to have its skull bones moved. D.D. Palmer worked with Still and took a course in osteopathy. Uh, he also was trained to a degree by Paul Castor, and he was a magnetic healer. And he came up with an idea pretty similar to Stills, but he presented it differently. And he said he was guided by the spirit of a dead physician, Jim Atkinson. And he was a magnetic and a psychic healer. And then, then he came up with a manipulative method, which he called chiropractic, founded on different principles from those of medicine. And he said, very honestly, the philosophy of chiropractic is founded upon vital functions performed by innate intelligence. Well, it's a mystery to me why students choose to study and qualify as chiropractors. And why don't they choose osteopaths? On what basis do they make that decision? Or why don't they become physiotherapists or nurses or doctors? I'm always asking chiropractors. I never get a sensible answer. Herbal medicine and herbalism using herbs has, of course, been around for millennia. Herbal tinctures, it says here, have been used since the beginning of time and are still some of the most powerful medicines in the world, except 
that to be classified as a medicine, it has to go through clinical trials. And herbal tinctures don't do that. And here is a Dutchy herbal detox tincture. Now, when it first came out, this detox tincture was indeed regarded as a medicine. And the Advertising Standards Authority said, hang on a minute, you haven't done any clinical trials. You can't call that a medicine. And so they had to rebrand the boxes, they had to redo them, and they had to introduce it as a food supplement. This, of course, cost the company quite a bit, which didn't, amu didn't amuse the owner of the company and promoter of this detox tincture. Acupuncture, sticking pins and needles, an ancient idea from China. The Yen Yellow Emperor's inner canon referred to balancing yin and yang, and that's still a philosophy in China. Even modern Chinese politics takes up on this balancing concept. The acupuncture points were aligned upon meridians, and those meridians, there's one shown here, but 12 is a common number, the number of great rivers in China, uh, and other diagrams will have 360. And exactly where these acupuncture points are is anybody's guess. And uh, different diagrams will set out these different acupuncture points with great seriousness. But if you can really tell the difference between one and another, you deserve the Nobel Prize. And David Colquhoun and Professor Steve Novella from America uh, has said acupuncture is a theatrical placebo. That's it. Move on. Why do we call it acupuncture? Because acus is Latin for a needle. Now, a Greek for a needle, particularly a surgeon's needle, is baloney. And I think the whole therapy should be called baloney therapy. I think that would be much more honest. Now, how do alternative medicines work? Or how does alternative medicine work? The answer, as you might have guessed, secret six, sex. I don't mean anything physical. We're not, we're not quite at the nine o'clock watershed yet in British summertime. No, I'm referring to the neurotransmitters, the amino acids, and most particularly dopamine. These are all the neurotransmitters which when flooding the system at certain times, cause the earth to move. Here's dopamine. It's a simple molecule, a couple of dopes stuck on the end of an amine. And would I, I would ask those of you who are of a sensitive disposition to avert your eyes, because I'm going to show, and John's given me special permission, John Richards has given me special permission to show this next slide on the screen. It will depict the Human Sex Act here before you now. And here is the human sex act. Uh, there are all those neurotransmitters releasing themselves at the vesicles there and uh, causing, as I say, the earth to move. And why do Camus believe in chemistry? There's no easy answer. I, I give you a few answers. Most importantly, I think, is his disillusionment. Patients, Camus, who turn to chemistry are simply disillusioned with conventional orthodox and paternalistic medicine. Many want greater autonomy and personalization. There's no doubt the chemists have charisma and patients are looking for a comfort blanket of consolation, hope and love. There are many psychological elements. I just simply list three here to stimulate you, but there are many others. There is delusion, an idiosyncratic belief, deception, Camis are simply vulnerable and gullible. They're duped by language, advertising and marketing. They're susceptible to quackery and fraud. And there is this undercurrent of denialism. They simply reject scientific evidence. Another element of psychology is confirmation bias. We, all of us, all of us, whether we're alternative practitioners or regular, we tend to favor any information that confirms our beliefs. And cognitive bias, well, we simply overestimate our beliefs. That's been described particularly by Dunning and Kruger, who talked about uh, the fact that the less you know, the less able you are to recognize how little you know or to recognize your limitations. And Dunning and Kruger article came out in 1999. But I have to say, over the last few months, I've actually seen it more commonly as people are now discussing science and discussing statistics in relation to 
the COVID coronavirus crisis. And people are beginning to understand that scientists themselves don't always know what's going on. Most of the scientists that have appeared in the United Kingdom have said, hands up, uh, we don't. Uh, many of the politicians say the opposite. And so the whole concept of cognitive bias is certainly very current. The basic problem in dealing with alternative medicine is the lack of critical thinking. Patients, practitioners simply ignore the fact spontaneous remission occurs. A second theme is what Bertrand Russell referred to as the teapot. Bertrand Russell said, look, if I were to say there is a teapot in orbit around the sun, it would be for me to prove it. It would be foolish of me to say, prove there isn't. The burden of proof lies with those who make unfalsifiable claims. Carl Sagan and others, he is not alone, but I use his name for simplicity. Others have said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, something alternative medicine leads aside. The big problem I come across in practice, dealing with patients in front of me who might be tempted to consider alternative medicine, is for them to understand that correlation does not imply causation. Co coincidences do happen. Simply because the cock crows and then the sun comes up does not mean that the cock crowing caused the sun to come up. Put it into Latin, if you like, post hoc ergo propter hoc a pretty basic logical fallacy. Here's a correlation, 99% correlation since the year 2000 up to 2009. 99% correlation between the divorce rate in Maine and the per capita consumption of margarine. What does that prove? Well, it improves that correlation does not imply causation. And I like to show this slide uh, to some alternative folk to demonstrate that the organic food sales has risen absolutely in line with the prevalence of autism, thus proving organic food causes autism. Wake up, Dr. Wakefield. Now, I just want to discuss as we come slowly towards the close, the inner secrets, the inner secrets of chemistry. Well, Henry Beecher wrote a book in 1955, a powerful placebo and said to array a man's will against his sickness is the supreme art of medicine. Arthur Shapiro wrote a book of the same name just a few years ago, and uh, he took the title with credit and said the history of medicine is largely the history of placebo effects. The idea of placebo effects or placebo responses has been around since 1722. Placebo, Latin, I will please. Yes, the patient, if asked, says, oh, that's nice, I feel better. But all the physical pummeling, the pillules, the potions, pins, the preternatural powers have no effect on any specific disease or tissue. Placebos, inert sugar pills, active drug, any treatment which is ineffective or not specifically effective for the symptom or disease. Archie Cochrane, after whom the Cochrane Collaboration for Evidence-Based Reviews was named, Cochrane said the effect of placebos has been shown by proper randomized controls, trials to be very large, and their use in correct place is to be encouraged. Now, I know a lot of people in this area do not like the idea of using placebos, because they feel that using placebos means deceiving the patient. Well, it doesn't need to mean that because you can tell the patient they're going to receive a placebo. And the extraordinary thing is they still work. Placebo effects rely on the power of suggestion, harnessing the imagination, enabling the patient, the patient to have imaginative experiences in which their pain will be dissipated or whatever other problems they have will evaporate. And this depends on focus concentration, which will be facilitated by the therapeutic practices I've been deriding. The pills, the potions, the hands-on, the waving, the woo, whatever. That will facilitate the focus concentration. concentration. The placebo pills responses 
vary. Size, shape, color, quantity, timing, and the price, the more expensive looking the placebo, perhaps coming out of a more expensive looking box, the better the effect. If the patient has knowledge placebos are being used, the responses may be diminished. But it has been shown properly by controlled trials of placebo against other placebos that the placebo's effects are not entirely negated. Uh, just as we wrap up, let's look at secret 11, hypnosis. You come across that in four different areas, a clinical area of hypnosis, trying to help patients with problems, experimental in the psychology labs, stage hypnosis, which I've been involved with as a magician, and in chemistry, which relies entirely on a form of self-hypnosis. Look, hypnosis is, depends upon the power of suggestion, harnessing the imagination and enabling imaginative experiences. It uses focused concentration, sitting quietly with a hypnotist quietly discussing and talking to a patient. In the old days, waving a watch on a chain. That technique could still be used today, tends to be not, not to be used. And, and hypnosis depends on facilitating and encouraging response expectancies. So really, hypnosis and placebo are one and the same, but different expressions of the same psychological process. Hypnotic inductions are expectancy modification procedures that produce placebo effects without using placebos. And it's possible to produce all the effects of hypnosis by giving subjects a placebo and telling them it's going to produce a hypnotic state. Now, this is proper psychological science, properly done in proper lab by Professor Irving Kirsch, who was professor in Hull in UK and then in Plymouth in UK and is now director of placebo studies at Harvard. This is real stuff. Placebos do work and so does hypnosis, which raises the question, why do regulators endorse all those other pills and, pull and pummeling and hand waving and woo? Well, I call it the Mayo Gambit. Politicians simply find it's better to offer something rather than nothing. And this is what Mao Zedong in China found, which is why he promoted his barefoot doctors. In many cases, real care is unaffordable. For example, even in America, Ohio expanded its Medicaid to include acupuncture because it was the only thing that the politicians in Hawaii could think of to deal with the opioid crisis. I don't think it did so. And if it did, it was using placebo effects. Uh, Florida now requires doctors to actually discuss acupuncture before they put in for any Medicaid claim. And here's a chap. And he is saying, this prescription won't make you feel better, but it will stop your whining and make everyone else feel better. And that about sums up where we are. So now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. I'll be delighted to answer any questions. Uh, but. Uh, You've paid such good attention, I'm going to issue you with the International Institute of Placebos Certificate. Now, all you have to do is contact me and I will be able to issue it to, to you. So uh, it would be nice to have the closing slides, which have now been removed by our... There he is. Uh, if we could just go on to the last couple of slides, John, that would be great. What have you got next for us? After the international, the next one down the list. That's a close up. That's what you get. That certifies you are now a placebist. Now, what can I keep that one on there, John? What can placebists offer? Well, I hope you can think about Mrs. Smith up there in the top left corner. Now you are all placebists and you have a better understanding of how placebos work and why. I hope you'll offer honesty and integrity, judgment and discrimination and a certain amount of critical thinking. I hope you'll give patients or your friends or your relatives or the chap in the pub time, trouble and understanding. Encourage patients to ask questions and encourage good, proper scientific research. Placebus offer consolation, hope and love. And the last slide. Thanks, John. The, the one with the sunset on. Where have we got to? Next one. Placebus offer consolation, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. So think critically, 
demand evidence and get in touch with me anytime you like. There is a last slide, John, with my, there we are. And that's where to contact me should you wish to do so. So any questions? That's it. Thanks, John. John's gone to sleep. He's been hypnotized. Sorry. <laughs> I'll put up the, the banner to show people how to ask a question. <clears throat> Right, so that was fantastic. It, it provided me with a lot of uh, comments too. Um, and uh, we've got some comments in the comment bank from our audience. First of all, I love the idea of homeopathic water. What's, what's it been diluted with? I've no idea. You'd have to ask Ainsworth. I mean, you see, you would take, in the case of homeopathic tap water, not just any old water, <laughs> no, 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 this is tap water. You would take one unit, so let's say a mill of tap water, mm. and you would then add that tap water to 99 units or mills, shall we say, of distilled water. Yes. <laughs> That's the, now, the potency, or the potency of the tap water when reverberated and succussed and shaken together, there, shake it together. That will now transfer the potency of the tap water into the solute. You now take one drop or one unit or one mil of that solution and you put it into another 99 units of distilled water. But never fear. That potency, that vibration, that magic remains. Yes. Etc. And you do that 30, you may do it 30 times, as many times as you want. It won't make any difference. Uh, of course not. It's nonsense. Um, and, you know, I obviously, perhaps like you, John, I, I follow some of the blog sites and I try to converse with homeopaths, but they are from planet Zog, you know. They, they've really got a... A very peculiar way of thinking. And I'm not a psychologist. I'm a humble surgeon. Uh, but I feel I feel sad about them because they, they've obviously, their critical thinking skills just aren't up to it. I don't know how they conduct the rest of their lives, except Monsieur Boiron. Now, Monsieur Boiron or, or Mr. Nelson, uh, they had the bright idea of starting up companies to flog the stuff. They, of course, are very rich. Uh, the yes. chap who runs Nelson's is actually a chap called Wilson, um, which is my grandfather's name as it happens. But that's beside the point. But he's a Scot. He owns the biggest art collection in Scotland outside the Scottish National Gallery. Um, he's done very well from flogging, mm -hmm. nothing, homeopathic, yeah. whatever. I'm not going to add any water, homeopathic or otherwise, to my beer in an attempt to make it stronger. That just... Uh, Crazy. So here's some interesting questions. Take a look at this one. Do you have an opinion on the use of psychedelics for treatment for anxiety and depression? Now, yes. Psychedelics yes. Absolutely. Absolutely, because I've got an opinion on everything. And um, when I was at medical school, I was offered LSD as part of a genuine medical under control trial. I did not take it. And funny enough, I don't know that any of my friends did. We just didn't quite like the idea. We knew a little of Timothy Leary's work. It seemed a bit too wacky and a bit too, frankly, dangerous. That remains my opinion. Uh, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I have no further opinion other than to say, if anybody is suffering from anxiety, they must get help. Uh, by all means, contact me and I can give you an address for a very good uh, source of assistance and help. Um, so I know some of people who listen to my talks are actually suffering from anxiety or various psychological circumstances. I myself still well clear of my own professional responsibilities, but I would be prepared to guide people in the right direction. But other than that, uh, no, no further opinion. So Karen wants to know, she had a Reiki treatment with a crystal 
and it made her feel heavy and hot. Uh, how do I explain? Um, well, Reiki, the various forms of Reiki, and part of Reiki is not only the laying on of hands in different positions, and a, a, Reiki, a Reiki therapist learns to put their hands in different positions, and then the Reiki therapist is given, when you reach level two in the Reiki training, you are given a series of charms, and perhaps that's what it was. It was a Reiki charm, not a crystal. I don't know. It may have been a crystal. It may have been combined therapy. Why not? It neither would make any difference. Now, um, this question of putting a treatment. Yeah, look, I'm a magician. I'm not going to tell you the secret of how it works. I can tell you that most competent magicians can work that form of magical trick. It is a trick. I'm not going to tell you how it works, uh, but you just have to take my word for it. Um, yes, uh, I felt that. I, I have myself been on the stage at the Magic Circle and Steve Banachek, uh, an English magician, uh, has given me a spoon and told me how hot it was feeling. And, you know, it felt hot. Now, look, come on. It did not heat up had the temperature been taken. That's the point. Had the temperature been taken and had the temperature been taken of your crystal, madam, uh, Karen, isn't it? Yes. Had the temperature been taken, it would not have been hot. I'm confident in knowing that because, my goodness, if your Reiki therapist actually could induce enough energy to make a crystal or a charm on your skin hot, then they would have the Nobel Prize because you cannot transfer energy by that means. That is such a remarkable circumstances. With the greatest respect, Karen, what on earth are they doing treating you when they could be lecturing the world and saving humanity with this remarkable ability to transfer heat into a crystal or a charm? Frankly, this was a psychological effect. After all, you felt the heat in your brain. That's where you had the feeling. And now how it transferred to your brain was a matter of the whole environment in which you were given the Reiki therapist. It's pretty straightforward. It's a form, frankly, of hypnosis. A lot of can depends on the mystery of, ever, of energy, doesn't it? I mean, every time we discover something new, that turns into a new form of cam. For example, you mentioned magnets. They were a mystery thing at one time. Then, of course, electricity. That was used as a treatment for after it had soon been discovered. And then there was radiation. As soon as that was discovered, that was used as a form of treatment. There's copper bracelets. The, the quantum healing nowadays. Everything that we don't really understand can be used as a form of treatment. I can hear some people talking. Are they actually talking to you? I, I don't I can't comment. I mean that's absolutely the case. Um and we were constantly looking for evidence. If there was any evidence that putting copper bracelets on folks made their arthritis better. And by evidence I mean reproducible, plausible scientific data uh, placebo controlled trials it would be straightforward enough you can put copper bracelets on some people and you can put similarly colored plastic painted to look like copper i mean there's so many ways of doing that to provide a placebo and then if the copper folk and people with the real copper got better we'd all of us say copper bracelets that's the answer but look there is no evidence look, i'm sorry to say this I'm only talking about those treatments for which there is no evidence. If there was evidence, it would not be regarded with disdain as, as a chemistry trick. It would be used in regular medicine. Yes, indeed. Here's a question. Have you ever tried yoga? Uh, not, not yoga, I mean, in the, in the fullest extent. Lots of different sorts of yoga. Um, I have been aware of and been to classes which apply the early principles, the, base, the basic principles, and it's wonderful. Uh, yoga used honestly and openly is not an alternative treatment uh, any more than hypnosis is an alternative treatment. Hypnosis used honestly is an honest, regular healthcare treatment, and likewise, yoga or mindfulness. And most of the current trend for mindfulness, I find the practitioners are very honest. They say, 
relax, take a deep breath, relax, etc., etc. That's perfectly honest. But if they started saying, uh, I'm going to wave my hands and imbue you with some energy, woo, well, now that means they've crossed the line into nonsense. And those are the folks that I challenge. And I say, you're being a quack, you're a chemist and uh, get out of the way because there are serious people involved in trying to make folks better and, and not to take advantage of their gullibility. So yoga, yeah, that's fine. There's lots of different sorts of yoga and some of it does get a bit freaky. Some of it gets tied up with ancient Indian religions and probably you can get rid of some of the peripheral stuff like that. But certainly the basic principle of yoga are great. Some years ago when we were still allowed to meet in pubs, we had a hypnotist come speak to us. Who He billed himself as the hypnotist who doesn't believe in hypnotism. <laughs> and he, he told us that he had, in the early days of uh, Darren Brown's career, he'd been an advisor to him. And uh, he, he gave us a, his account of what uh, stage hypnotism could be explained by. He, he gave a couple of alternative explanations. And then we, when we asked him if he could do a piece of hypnotism for us, he declined. I don't think we, we were in a skeptical audience. I don't think he would wanted to risk it. Well, I'd have had a go um, with some of the techniques I know. Uh, I may have failed. Uh, maybe he, this guy didn't dare fail. I, I'm prepared to fail. Uh, but I would have had a go, and within a few moments, I would hope I would have been able to demonstrate, for entertainment purposes, I would have been able to demonstrate hypnosis. I have used hypnotism when I was in America for clinical therapeutic purposes under the supervision of an American doctor whose patient it was, and we were using it in two areas. One was to help stop smoking, and the other area was to reduce the amount of analgesia need, needed for childbirth to almost nothing at all, uh, practically no analgesia at all. And, and, and one lady I remember who had a lovely parturition in the sense she delivered with a pretty much no pain, or certainly, and the trick of hypnosis is um, that she had no pain that troubled her. And that's the secret. You, you, you get the patient to throw that inner switch. She will still feel the painful stimuli, but she will divert them. And that is where the hypnosis comes in, in diverting the sensations of pain. So she was satisfied to that extent. And I myself have been hypnotized, uh, not heavily and deeply, but I did experience the hypnotic uh, induction process. So I have a little connection, but I am not a hypnotist as such. I can demonstrate stage hypnosis if I'm asked to, and if I'm paid inordinately large sums of money. <laughs> Some of this is quite dangerous, though, isn't it? I mean, uh, manipulating a baby's skull strikes me as being very risky, considering the part of the skull. No. Yeah, they're not ossified yet, are they? Absolutely not. It's totally bizarre. Um, all I would say is, I don't know of any cases where a child has been harmed by a craniosacral therapist. That is possibly because they don't report. And surprisingly, neither will the parent, because the parent will be somewhat embarrassed and maybe even culpable for having taken their child to such a therapist. So unless the child is very seriously disabled, which won't happen, frankly, uh, then the craniosacral therapist places hands on the skull of the child and makes a claim. They yeah. claim they are moving the bones, but they don't. Woo! The yes. parent, remember, 95% of paediatrics involves treating the patient, not the child. The parent relaxes, the parent is more content, something's been done about little Jimmy's colic, little yeah. Jimmy goes home, he falls asleep after having his milk, and the mother is relaxed, she lactates better, or she is just more relaxed, little Jimmy is more relaxed, little Jimmy does not cry with colic, mummy says, 
isn't craniosacral therapy wonderful? Yes. Well, care is wonderful, but that is not the same as craniosacral therapy. Uh, and that's where the, the gullibility, the nonsense, the fakery, the scannery, that's where that creeps in. So the true answer is craniosacral therapy. I don't think they move the bones at all. And if they move them a fraction, a tiny, tiny fraction, and I've no evidence that they do, uh, but even if it was shown that they did, well, a tiny fraction wouldn't matter. Mm. But um, I think that's where we are with CST. And yet, uh, CST, oh, craniosacral therapy, mm, you know, a lot of people will will swear by it. Yes. But one, one example of where it really was harmful was last year, one of the mothers of a colleague, a, a member of the same class as one of my daughters had cancer and she flew to south america a couple of times for some mysterious cure and of course sadly she's dead now but she was refusing the conventional treatment she was refusing the chemotherapy in favor of this uh, whatever it was that she was flying at great expense to to endure. I would seek to persuade such a patient or relatives not to. Mm. But I wouldn't I wouldn't try very hard to persuade them not to. Mm. Because at the end of the day, if they are more content, if they find a degree of satisfaction in spending their money that way, I would tell them what I know of the science yes. and what I know of some of the ethics and I would leave it with them yes. but you know people are allowed to be stupid oh, and yeah. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's very wrong for doctors or ND I would say it's very wrong for, for society and for politicians to force beliefs on anybody and that applies if we know I don't want to talk about contemporary politics, but we all know there are totalitarian regimes around the world that will put you in prison if you do not agree with their belief systems. Uh, I don't want to labor the point, but it's the same psychological dynamic. And the fact is, if uh, if a patient does believe that spending a lot of money in South America, it's usually, well, it's usually Mexico is quite popular. It's anywhere out of the United States. The United States, for all its faults, it uh, does actually try to take care of its people. It does tr have advertising standards. It does have medical standards. Yes, there are some crooks and they have been arraigned before the medical authorities and they yes. you found a way around it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a criticism of American legal system that such people can find a way around it. OK, but we're only talking ones and twos. Uh, they're ones and twos who become very rich, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And yet it's very sad with, with gullible patients and anybody who has cancer. I don't think I have got cancer as yet, um, not that I know of, um, but I have to say, how would I feel if I did? You know, yeah. I would be tempted to think, well, is there something somewhere? Mm. Uh, it would be pretty hard to, to turn down the possibility. Yeah. Absolutely, you don't want to kill hope. So, I can't kill hope. It's no. so difficult. Uh, it, it, there's no easy answer. I did what you would have done, I think, because at, this, at that time, a new book had just been published by a doctor um, about uh, fake medicine, I suppose. I can't remember what it was called, but I bought a copy of it and gave it to this woman just so that she had, you know. That's what you can do. Or you can, or you can uh, buy her a copy of my book, which is Real Secrets of a Alternative Medicine. And which I, uh, I have well, here. I've got a copy and I was going to show it to you, but I've, <laughs> it's over on my shelf over there. I'll go and find it. I'll go find good. it. Look at all these pages. Yeah. And, and it's historical. It goes through the whole thing. And it's so readable. There's notes on every chapter. Honestly, this is yeah. really uh, The point is, this is my homework. Because in order yeah. to answer the question as yeah. to how come, how yeah. come people are so daft that they believe in all these things, how yeah. come? I myself had to go right back to Aristotle or the Babylonians. I had yeah. to see, where did we come from? You know, why is it we humans begun to get the idea that those three stars up there in a funny straight line represent the belt of a hunter called Orion? And, yeah. you know, it's, it's dealing with very basic 
human knowledge, science, philosophy, metaphysics, religion, if you like. Uh, it's, it's all muddled together. The human brain is a funny place. Well, I would, I, I, again, I'm like you. I was being interviewed on the radio one time and about a book that I'd just written. And they asked me a question which I couldn't remember the answer to, so I looked it up. <laughs> well, we've all, we, we've all got Google now. I don't think. Uh, I've, this, is I've, why, this is why I've we've used these on my phone, but I've used the timer so I didn't overrun my talk. Uh, yes. But I haven't used Google this evening. But if you'd have caught me out with a trick question, I would have been Googling. Yes. Well, this is this is why we write these books. They're memories. <laughs> yes. Anyway. I've got a few more. Uh, Great, let's go. Let's go. Here, look, this person, uh, he's asking for your opinion. Yeah. Hey, who is this chap? I like this guy. I have to be frank. Uh, this young man here, uh, they, that is my view entirely. That's exactly my view. I don't think that they are, um, they're dumb. Uh, I think they're playing dumb. And uh, it, it's a racket. It's hard to prove that because when you meet them, they're so serious. And, oh, you wouldn't know. You haven't been trained as a homeopath. You don't understand. Ugh. And then you say, hang on, what are you talking about? I haven't jumped off the Eiffel Tower, but I have a pretty shrewd idea. It wouldn't do me any good. Yes. Um, you know, it's, you know we're, we're dealing with very strange and bizarre thought processes. Uh, I'm a humble surgeon. I, I just deal with practicalities. And you'd need to be a psychologist, if not a psychiatrist, to do under, better understand why folks choose to go down this alternative path. But I agree with the who is he? I agree with him, with, with, with the premise of, of, his, of his commentary. Is, isn't, isn't Pochard a type of duck? I think he might be quack thermometer or something in his name there anyway he's he's given us a number of comments look at this one yeah well the reason uh, can i just comment on the royal family i do have a go at charles and i have a go at charles for the following reason he did not have to but he did accept the honor of being an honorary fellow of the royal society britain's premier scientific society founded by charles ii which is why it's the royal society for the yeah. full title royal society for the advancement of science mm. now he didn't have to do that but if he's going to wear that badge with any degree of honesty he surely must engage with the scientific principles and yet he promotes homeopathy if he just quietly went to his own boudoir and took a homeopathic remedy when he felt a bit unwell or when he felt nobody loved him or when he felt misunderstood or had an ache or a pain or whatever it is befalls him. If he simply saw in the past, Peter Fisher, I don't know who his homeopath is now. If he simply spent an hour talking to a homeopath at the end of which the homeopath said questions like, do you like boiled eggs? Are you alarmed if there is thunder? Uh, do you like eggs that are brown? Oh, right. These are genuine questions that homeopaths ask. And they put these questions together in order to decide and make a recommendation. Well, I think, if I may say so, you need a little bit of sulfur. So you need this 30C sulfur preparation or Thajuda or dozens of other whatever Berlin Wall yes they grind up Berlin Wall and they put a drop of the ground Berlin Wall into another drop into another drop into another drop 30 times and they flog this ground up Berlin Wall for patients who are feeling disassociated so <laughs> sure you know, if that's what turns Prince Charles on, good luck to him. That's his business. But he doesn't stop there. No. He allows himself to be a patron of the Hopiopathic Society. He yeah. promotes homeopathy by giving his badge, his royal warrant, to Ainsworth's homeopathic pharmacy. Mm. So that puts him in the public domain. And that is why I am entitled to challenge him. Yes. Uh, he doesn't want me and my colleagues, friends, to challenge him, then he should get out get out of the kitchen. You know, that's the deal. 
if he wants to promote homeopathy, he should have the guts to stand up and explain how come. What is the evidence that he's got, which he is keeping secret from us, which I think is the height of distastefulness, particularly for a fellow of the Royal Society. He must have a reason for believing in homeopathy and saying, it makes me feel better. That's not good enough. And he knows that's not good enough to make a recommendation to other people. That is good enough for him privately and possibly his private family. If he wants to keep it private, I make no further comment. But he put himself in the public domain, he should be shot down. And I don't mean that, really. I mean metaphorically. <laughs> On the basis of like cures like, yeah. what's the Berlin Wall supposed to cure? Um, well, the like cure like is a very ancient concept, way back in the Babylonian times, taken oh. up and promoted by Hahnemann. The idea of the Berlin Wall, it kept out dissonant, dissonant thoughts, dissonant <laughs> concepts those people over there so berlin war helps people who are feeling threatened and challenged and, and disassociated from the goings-on of life so if that's the diagnosis that is made then maybe berlin war or that's to say a homeopathic remedy made from the berlin war maybe maybe this will help you and of course all of this is proved because to a homeopath Proving does not mean establishing veracity. Proving means uh, it's, it's proving in the sense that we prove a gun. We fire a gun and see if it explodes in your face. And or you do it on a rig, of course. And uh, uh, if it doesn't explode, then the gun has been proved and now you can sell it. And if you're Mr. Purdy, you can even sell it to Prince Charles uh, so that he can shoot some pheasants or grace. Uh, but that's proving a gun. It's the same word of proof that the homeopaths use. But mm. of course, many homeopaths take proving to mean, therefore, there is good evidence. And it, it, there are different meanings of the word proof. Oh, and yes. that's, part, yes. that's part of being a magician. Uh, oh, I've got a ball in this hand. Oh, no, you haven't. It's in this hand. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's all deceit and deception. And I'm afraid that's all part of the way the language is used. Yes, I had a conversation about partly about proof with AC Grayling a couple of weeks ago, and yes, it's it's a, a word with many meanings. Words with many meanings, Charlie. You've got to be clear what you're. Now, children, chiropractor. This is Thermometre du Pochard again. Well, you know, again, um, I wish we could pronounce his name or knew what it meant, or but the fact is, I. I have to agree. I, I agree that that is child abuse. And uh, again, I would want to know what the chiropractic was. It may have been a real back crack, a real crack, uh, or it may have been a uh, a, a, a fake, a fake um, event just to please the parent. And I'm just going to look at, oh, I've got so many magic tricks. I, all right, I'll reveal to you a magic little, a little magic secret. I should have been better prepared. I do have a, what magicians call a cracker, believe it or not. It's a little bit of plastic that makes a cracking noise when we squeeze it. Yeah. Now, if a chiropractor was to take a child and lie them down and the parents the other side of the room and the chiropractor does this and, and then <laughs> makes this, they could even snap their own fingers. So yes. I, I, my fingers don't crack. But some person's fingers, they can crack their fingers, as you know. And then uh, the parent says, oh, and the child doesn't say much. And then the chiropractor says, there we are. You're better now. It's all part of selling and, and marketing and hypnosis, really. You're fooling the parent, not so much the child. I doubt very much the chiropractor did actually move the bones of a child's spine. I would only say, and I am somebody who has operated on the bones of a child's spine, unlike any chiropractor that I know. Mm. But I have to say, I very much doubt a chiropractor moves the spine, uh, the bones of the spine of a child significantly. I mean, they move them in a general sense, but mm. not beyond a normal range. And mm. the cracking noise is a gag. It's a trick. It's a magician's trick. And yes. I apologize, John, for not having it, but you can imagine my little clacker thing. Yes, which, yes, yes. Which you can steal in your hand. Yes. Next time you see a chiropractor working that effect, uh, let him know that you're going to come and examine his person and find the cricket, the, the clacker. But mm. wait until you've done it. Otherwise, of course, he won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've 
actually overrun the length of time that we've told people this show will last for. So I, I'm going to thank you very much for being so fantastic and entertaining as well. Um, I'm alarmed to hear that you are responsible for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I've never known who to blame for inventing it, but now I do. <laughs> and um, before we bring this to a close, I'd like to thank our audience for watching and any future watchers that see this as a podcast after the live streaming has finished. And I'd like to invite everyone to like and subscribe and comment and share in the usual way that I forget to say because I'm very bad at marketing. <laughs> Richard, next week we have philosopher Stephen Law. And the week after that, we have, you'll like this, Richard, Kevin Quantum, who is a magician who is currently on Britain's Got Talent. Will, oh. he, will he get through to the final? Watch this space. <laughs> I have a prediction. I will write it in an envelope and show it to you before next week. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye.